Right. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Is is everyone sorry? My for some reason the video share for me turned off. Did I lose? Is that a what was that a was that a yes from the slide? Sorry, I couldn't hear uh so I can see the videos. Yeah, we All right, perfect. Uh, all right, uh, sorry for the technical delay. Thank you so much for joining everyone. I'm so glad to have you here today as one of our Idea Accelerator showcases. Um, we really love these opportunities to share what our students have been working on um, and get to really engage with what you've been doing and hear about all the exciting ideas that you have in the biobuilder biotechnology space. So at BioBuilder, our mission is really to inspire students to learn and love life sciences and biotechnology and synthetic biology. Um, we want to sort of give you both the academic tools that you need to understand the core principles of how we can take biological systems and apply them to do important things, as well as the creative space to roam and think about what problems are important to you and how you can use biotechnology to address some of those problems and opportunities in the world. Um, Within that, we have a curriculum based around the design, build, test, and learn cycle, um, both for students and teachers, where as students, we can integrate sort of biology and engineering knowledge through practical and often hands-on lessons, um, as well as we offer club activities and school-to-work experiences. Um, and if you're really interested in doing hands-on work, we offer a BioBuilder club that um, has experiments uh, built in as well that where you can get some hands-on time in the lab. Um, and for teachers, we like to enable teachers to learn new methods of teaching biology and biotechnology to engage and inspire young scientists in their class. Within that, we have programs all throughout online, uh, experiment guidelines and programs, uh, the Idea Accelerator program, which you are, are very familiar with, and we will uh, get to your videos in a moment, um, as well as the BioBuilder Club and more advanced seminars and uh, experiment work boxes that we can send out to classrooms. And with that, we'll start right off with our uh, with our presentation videos. Uh, so this first group is from Oregon Episcopal School. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander Chin, and this is a microbial solution to plastic pollution uh, by team digestion. Um, not team digestion, but, uh, but team, team digestion. Um, all right, let's start by talking about plastics. Plastic is bad, but not all the time. Um, we actually use it as an incredibly useful material in part due to its durability, um, which is in turn caused by the fact that nothing really breaks it down. Uh, in fact, when you leave it around, I think there are statistics that say something crazy, like 100 years it takes to digest a lot of the plastics that we consume on a daily basis. Um, and the reason for this is that plastic has been, along, been around for such a small time period that evolution hasn't had time to catch up. Um, so what's the solution to our plastic pollution problem? Well, we can try helping evolution out by trying to design a process that transforms PET into environmentally benign compounds. So the idea here is to, um, I was lying when I said evolution had not come up with a way to digest PET because it actually has. In 2016, um, some Japanese researchers found a bacteria that actually already makes an enzyme called PETase. Yeah, pretty crazy. Na nature, nature finds a way, as they say. But the idea is to create a modified version of the existing bacteria um, that A, is more efficient. Secondly, it has a, a kill switch or a method of restriction because we don't want to necessarily um, not be able to control this, um, this bacteria. So the interesting thing about this project is that I'm envisioning not just a bacteria, but an entire incubation substrate uh, bacterium waste model where um, heat is used as a way of controlling the bacteria and growing it. Uh, so you put in, you, you take um, PT, you put it in a substrate for the bacteria to grow on in order to maximize surface area, uh, and you incubate it uh, with that plastic waste uh, until it decomposes. Um, but once there's leakage or the bacteria escapes into a colder environment, it self-destructs. Um, few questions unresolved. Does gene expression transfer effectively from one bacteria uh, to another? In this case, the bacteria that was discovered in 2016 and the bacteria that um, I'm designing. Sorry, I've got the notification that the video is going out of focus. I'm going to just stop share for a moment and see if I can maybe reshare it and hopefully that'll go away. Um, apologies for any, any blur in that. Today, 
Um, second of all, we need to pick some genetic components. Is this uh, uh, better? And the question of how it will improve. Great. Um, so there's the question of structural versus scale improvement, where um, there have been some studies regarding how to actually improve the structure of the enzyme, but I'm more sort of envisioning a scale improvement in terms of vector. And I'm getting an issue that people can't hear the video too well. It's a little quiet on my end too. I'll see if I can increase the um, synthesize uh, this sure. enzyme. All right, thank you for coming to my talk. All right, well, very cool talk. Do a round of applause and then maybe go back a bit. Uh, were, so were people able to hear the the video at all or was it just a bit quiet? It was a bit quiet on my end too, so. Mine worked okay from my end. Okay. I wonder if it's individual computer settings or I don't know, but it is definitely more clear now. Yeah, okay. uh, we could hear pretty clearly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, sorry for those who uh, couldn't, have, couldn't hear it as well. Hopefully the next talk will be uh, a bit louder. Um, but really. Like it sorry, it looks like you guys are in a uh, in a science classroom there. You and Kai, you're in the hallway. You can just join them. <laughs> Do a big group. Okay. All right. Um, well, very cool work uh, working on PET and plastic degradation in bacteria. Um, I really like the idea of choosing your uh, chassis and choosing the, the origin of the enzymes carefully so that way you can optimize them. Um, that's always a really great approach. Uh, I don't think, is, is Alex here right now for questions? No. Um, well, very cool work. I'd be really curious to think about uh, or to ask about sort of uh, the deployment of this, especially, and how you, how you would use it to degrade plastic on a large scale um, and to, to hear more about that. But very cool project. Great job to Alex. All right, our next video, hopefully without technical difficulties, uh, is the uh, koala team. Uh, Will and Andrea. Hello, we are the koala team from Oregon Episcopal School. My name is Will Cohen. And I'm Rhea Kamenini. The topic area we decided to work in was medicine. Initially, we had other ideas related to environmental sciences, but we decided to focus on medicine because we wanted to research and understand a disease which is both prevalent and under-researched, which is CMV, or cytolomegalovirus. Cytolomegalovirus, or CMV, is the most common virus transmitted to newborns. CMV is often undetectable until doing a formal lab test, and there's currently no way to test for CMV at home. So with this project, what we wanted to try to do was create an effective way to test for CMV, CMV at home. Um, the system design should be able to change color when detecting the cells of CMV and the input would be the cells detecting the CMV and the output would be a change of color using like a fluorescent dye. Um, the next step to design the system is to figure out what fluorescent dye can bind to the antigen in CMV in order to create that color changing aspect of the biosensor and also we need to figure out um, what the antigen in CMV is called and like how we can obtain those parts. Um, some of the other ideas we thought about were to make an actual uh, model of a PCR CM CMV test that would allow people to um, get a rapid di diagnosis um, through a saliva test. Thank you. All right, great work, Ray and Will. That's a really great project. I love how you picked a specific problem that can have a really specific solution and I think we've all been thinking a lot about diagnostics lately and how important diagnostics are. Um, and this would be a really impactful one. Uh, yeah, I'd be curious to hear um, if, if uh, you're able to answer questions um, a bit about sort of the inspiration for this project and how you would uh, imagine this if it, if it worked perfectly and you were able to have this test working, how it would be distributed and how you'd encourage people to use it. Yeah, you. Sorry, I'm going to move it a little closer so that you can mm -hmm. that you can hear us better. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Do you want to answer this? Can you repeat the question <laughs> just one more time? <laughs> yeah. So, say if you got the uh, the test working perfectly, um, how would you how would you envision this being used? And I think you mentioned that a bit. If it's used for mothers or for babies, would it be? Do you think you'd be able to test it from? something like saliva or do you think you'd need blood to test this um, and would it be just like an over-the-counter thing at CVS? Yeah so basically we wanted to make those you know how COVID tests are you can buy them from like Walgreens or something and mm -hmm. then home and get a diagnosis like that um, we wanted to um, 
be able to make a test for CMV so that mothers or like anyone who's like considering having a child or like wants to test their child for the disease um, can take those tests because right now the only tests available are PCR threat tests that have to go to a lab and and, and it takes to, a long it's time. For, you, they, you need blood, you, like you, you need to test blood yeah, as well. So this one would be through a saliva test and then they'd put like the saliva swab in a solution and if it changes colors that would indicate that they do have the virus um so yeah that was like our kind of hope yeah a lot of the inspiration was drawn from current covid like at home mm -hmm. tests yeah yeah that's a that's a fantastic idea and if you move forward with the project uh, i'd be really curious to hear how it goes great work great thank, thank you. you all right uh, if, and if anyone from the audience has questions for any of the groups, feel free to, to chime in and ask you to raise a hand or just uh, feel free to unmute and ask. All right, I'll move on to the next talk otherwise. Uh, Joe from also Oregon Episcopal School. Hello everyone, my name is Joe and I'm from Oh yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Joe and I'm from Oh yes. The topic I'm going to do is transgenetic plants. And my, my initial idea was to make a microorganism that decompose oil spill in ocean or oil on kitchenware. However, I realized that there's a lot of food shortage due to drought or extreme weather around the world. So I think that if I can make a transgenetic plant that can survive in extreme environment, that will be really helpful. So the d input of my design is the density of the water and the temperature of the surrounding that the cell detect. And the output will be the way that root grows or the, the decision of the plant to shut down or come up with a way to prevent water from losing. Uh, I came up with two possible methods. The first one is to use a gene gun and shoot genes into the plant. The second one is to use agrobacterium all in which I can replace the tumor gene in the tumor inducing plasmid with the gene I'm going to design and let the plant behave the way I want it to be. Here are my questions about my idea. So the first one is that which, which matter would work better, the gene gun or the agrobacterium? The second one is that, can I change how a mature plant behave or do I need to grow new plants to test my ideas? The third one is that, should I just try to make the roots of the plant more efficient at gathering water during drought through changing the DNA? Or is it possible to insert a DNA that let the plant decide on which root system to go with? The last question I have is that, is there an effective way to help plants survive in extreme temperature? Thanks for listening. All right. Great job, Joe. That was a really uh, cool project idea. And you really clearly looked into the, the current top of the research there, because um, gene guns and the, the virus you mentioned are two of the, the really common ways of getting DNA into plants during as, as current technologies and current labs. Um, I do really like the idea of microbes that eat oil off of kitchenware, though. That would be such a helpful thing cleaning up in the kitchen. That uh, That's something that I've had to deal with a lot. Though great um yeah awesome work does anyone from the audience if is is joe uh here no, currently? he's no. not he's not here he's running in the cross country district meet right now so well best of luck to joe hopefully that uh <laughs> that goes well for him um yeah I'd, I'd be curious to um hear a bit more about this idea of plant switching behavior based on roots because there's a lot of science that would be great for that um but yeah great great work to joe very cool project I think we will move on to the next group. All right, we have uh, Maggie and Tiago. Hello, my name is Tiago Moreno. And I'm Maggie McCaffrey, and we're from Oregon Episcopal School. And today we will be talking about E. coli and telomeres and detecting organism health. We chose to do our project in biomedicine because we believe it can be extremely impactful. It also just sounded most interesting to us. And because we haven't done science-based research in medicine before, and we wanted to, to try something new. What is telomeres? According to the NIH, a telomere is a region of repetitive DNA sequences at the end of a chromosome. Telomeres protect the ends of chromosomes from becoming frayed or tangled. 
Over time, telomeres degrade to the point where they can no longer repair chromosomes, and the chromosome becomes unable to replicate. Having too little telomeres or short telomeres can cause a number of health issues and increase risk of dying from heart and infectious diseases by three and eight times, respectively. However, having too much telomeres can increase the risk of cancer and immortalizing cancer cells. Telomeres is the enzyme that actively maintains telomere length using RNA, HTR, and protein HTERT to add TTAGGG to the ends of chromosomes. Our system idea is to use E. coli as a chassis because it doesn't have telomeres or tel telomeres because its chromosomes are circular. Um, so that will not be affecting the output. And then our idea is to create a bacteria that reacts to the quantity of telomeres and change different colors for the different level. We'll make it change blue if there's too much, green if there's a good amount, or red if there's too little telomeres. Our input will be the amount of telomeres in asparagales because they produce the same type of telomeres or telomeres as humans. And then our output will be the change in color of the E. coli. What's next? Figuring out the exact different system devices and DNA parts. Deciding which plant we'll be using. Incorporating multiple colors into the system, such as red, blue, and green, and figuring out the codes for each. Making different colors appear for different amounts of telomeres, and creating telomeres detectors based on the telomeres RNA component, possibly, or possibly based on the protein of the telomeres reverse transcriptase. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, another really great project. I'm loving the variety of ideas that we're getting here and how many different really interesting uh, premises that people have worked on for these projects. Um, really great creativity here. Uh, yeah, I like how much you've looked into the multiple color aspect. Um, and I didn't know there are other organisms that make the same uh, telomerases as humans. That's really interesting. Um, do we have anyone from this group here today? Yep. Not right Hello. Now. We do. Hello. Yes. Oh, great. Very cool project. Um, yeah. I wonder, have you thought about also a system that maybe you could have in either, I don't know how you'd be able to get it to, to most cells in a body, but a system that could potentially, um, if it detects too much or too little telomerase help or too, or too long or too short telomeres, um, go in and, and start fixing this as well. Have you thought about what you could do if you saw that the, the color was not where you wanted it? Yeah, we thought about that a little bit and we didn't come to a really good conclusion. Um, some foods are definitely higher in telomeres than others, um, but I'm not sure how big a role diet can play on the amount um, in a plant or body, I guess. Uh, but yeah, still is something to look into. Yeah, very cool. And this is, this is already a lot to work on, so definitely great, great work here. Thank you. All right. Again, uh, great job, team. And we will next. We have uh, Shreya's presentation. Hello, I am Shreya Mainani, and I decided to um, think of how to dissolve microplastics using bioengineering. So, next slide. <laughs> so, um, uh, the reason I decided to go to microplastics was because I was thinking on how to help the environment. My first idea was to go into medicine and try to use bioengineering there. However, I have always heard of how terrible microplastics were and how toxic they can be once ingested, but it's hard to not ingest them because of how they are. So that's why I decided this is an important field of research to think about. So I have not decided on a specific device nor chassis yet, but I do realize that I do need a device that can detect microplastics and then maybe another one that can also release something that can dissolve the microplastics into something completely harmless to the environment and to our own bodies. Now the chassis, I'm hoping I can find something that is a common microbe, something that's easily found, easily replicates, so this can be really widespread and it wouldn't be a big deal about this and my input would be microplastics or a detection for microplastics once the microbe detects microplastics it should have an output of hydroxyl radicals which should be able to dissolve them uh, the microplastics 
and hydroxyl radicals do not have any harmful uh, remnants, I believe, so it should be completely safe. If I were to continue this, I would hopefully pick a specific chassis and which devices I would use for this project. Thank you for watching. All right. Great project. Very cool, Shreya. Uh, yeah, and this is a, a fantastic level of, of uh, detail for this kind of project too, like picking a chassis that can be later down the line, as long as you understand the problem that you're wanting to address um, and have a good idea of your inputs and outputs. That's uh, a great place to get, especially with how, how quickly have you worked on these projects. Um, all right, and I don't think I see uh, Shreya here unless she's part of the group, but Really great project. Um, she was here for a minute, but I think she had to leave. So, but right. I, I see Alexander joined us. So we have at the end questions for his project. Alexander, we watched yours first. Oh, so. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm late. That's okay. We no can worries. <laughs> yeah, glad you're able to join us. We'll definitely have time for uh, questions at the end. Absolutely. Well, great job, Dushria. Very cool project. Um, yeah, I really like the the clear input and output here, and I think that. All the details can be worked out later. That's that's great to have that in mind. All right. Hello. And then next is Sophia. Hey, I'm from OES, and my idea was pH adaptive microalgae. So my topic is going to be biofuel um, with algae. Microalgae is a biomass source, um, but farming algae on that massive level. Um, problem come up, that comes up there is contamination. So the idea was to make more robust algae to be able to outcompete contaminants. Um, so system design, the system goal is to make algae um, that was able to adapt to high pHs because I said on specifically uh, robustness in terms of pH. So the input would be high pH, the output would be that the cell pH equalizes by um, making it more acidic to compensate. Um, the chases would be um, a species of microalgae in the taxon uh, chlorophyta because that's really good for, uh, for biofuel because it's high growth rate intensity. Um, parts uh, constitute promoter and, and a pH dependent promoter because so we get like a, a kind of a baseline um, pH adaptability and then it, when it's in a pH high environment it ups the protein um, production to be able to compensate more. The protein in question would be um, a sodium hydrogen antiporter which is used by some alkophiles and it basically like swaps a sodium ion for a hydrogen ion, pretty cool. Um, um, uh, further questions would be, can we do this the other way with like low pHs and can you do that in like the same cell? Um, something I liked about this project is algae. I really like algae. I think it's really interesting. Um, so thank you for listening. Yeah, great work, Sophia. Algae is a really cool organism. That's a great chassis, especially for things like biofuels. It's fantastic at growing fast and not needing much. So absolutely a, a great choice there. Um, I don't think I see Sophia here, but- sure she's here, she's here. Oh, hello, great. Uh, oh, you're part of the big group, fantastic. Um, yeah, so I, I really like the clarity you had on the devices that you'd wanna do here and thinking about sort of, it would work with, with high pH, could we do low pH as well? Um, I guess, with, with those systems, are there specific contaminants that you were worried about when talking about contaminants? Um, uh, I'm not sure. I, um, when I was researching biofuel and like, um, uh, like kind of problems that come up with using algae as a biofuel, um, it's better than like corn because you can grow it more densely, but you do have to deal with contamination if it's like a closed system. And if it's open system, you have to have it dense enough that it can like out contain compete contaminants. I didn't really research like what specific contaminants um, would be a problem, but I um, was uh, made the choice to do pH because I don't have the knowledge to like make the cell better at fighting off um, contaminants. So I thought if we can make it be able to live in environments like an extremophile that other bacteria, common bacteria can't live in, that might be able to help. So that was my thinking there, but I do not know specifically what contaminants I would be dealing with. No worries at all. That's a really cool line of thinking for that. And that's great. I think definitely looking to extremophiles and things that can exist where a lot of other organisms can't is a great way of designing a system that would really only be usable for your one system and also a potentially making biofuels out of spaces that we wouldn't be able to get fuel from otherwise or that we're, we're not currently uh, 
that, that aren't currently used by other organisms. So really great project, good work. All right. And next up is Tom. I'm Tom from Oregon Episcopal School, and I decided to work on manufacturing carbon fiber. And initially I had other ideas relating to fuel and creating biofuel, but I decided to... I'm Tom from Oregon Epis Episcopal School, and I decided to work on manufacturing carbon fiber. And initially I had other ideas relating to fuel and creating biofuel, but I decided to focus on carbon fiber because it seemed like a more original idea. Um, so, yeah. and then my device, the input is going to be CO2 for carbon dioxide, and then it goes through the device, and the output is carbon fibers, specifically the carbon fibers that make up carbon fiber, not the actual woven carbon fiber. Um, then device, device number one, it turns CO2 into carbon and oxygen. And then device number two takes carbon and turns it into fibers. So it releases oxygen and the carbon fibers. Um, so a few things I still have to figure out is how these devices actually work. But um, one of the things that I know is that both of them have been done before. For device one, it's been done before using uh, to create like carbon-based products um, using carbon dioxide. Um, it's done by a company called Kyverdi, um, so it's, it, it is possible to do that. And then device two, they've used, uh, they've created like nanofibers using this uh, E. coli infected with a phage virus, and so they used nano that to create nanofibers using biomineralization. So that has also been done before. Um, and then lastly, something that surprised me is how new the genetic engineering field is because a lot of things that I expected to be done haven't been done before, including carbon fiber, but uh, making carbon fiber, but also other things. Um, and that makes it very interesting to me that nothing has been laid down yet and there's really very open, uh, there's no like specific direction to go into. There's a lot of directions that we can take. Very cool, great project, Tom. Yeah, I agree. The field is uh, very new and very uh, open in terms of what what has and hasn't been done. And there's a lot of uh, really great opportunities in the space. I think carbon fiber is a really interesting one too, and what different sort of biomaterials we can make using cells. Um, I think I might have seen something about this on Canvas and talked about spider silk already. But one of my personal favorites is bioengineered spider silk, which has really strong properties, somewhat like carbon fiber, um, and being able to make that in in large quantities. Um, I think we have Tom here, I see in the, in the group. Uh, so yeah, I'd be curious um, if uh, with, with this system, if you can make sort of as much carbon fiber as you want, um, do you think its properties would be different than the current way we make carbon fiber? And do you think there could be like advantages or disadvantages to that? Um, yeah, so there is, uh, I asked this, I asked some questions about this during like in the office hours thing and um, I forgot exactly who it was, but someone gave me some ideas that like uh, cellulose from bacteria can like make carbon fiber more like fire resistant or heat resistant or something like that. So it would have like different properties, I guess. And another one of my ideas was also that you could like do a special weave using uh, bacteria because it's more like precise kind of. So it'd be easier to do that. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, the, the fireproof thing is interesting. I, I didn't know that that would be a, a great application. I could see if you had maybe cells still in the carbon fiber too, you could think about having like a self healing material, where if like you, you had a hole in it, the bacteria would be able to weave it back together and be able to, to replace parts of it. Um, I think definitely a lot of cool things that could be done in, in this space with that fire material. Yeah. All right, great work. All right, um, now we have Nicole and Yuankai. Hello, we are the Fun Guys team from OES, and the topic of area we decided to work on was the environment, and we have chosen the radiotrophic fungi as our model organism. 
Though the system we designed could shield radiation and be used as a bioremediation tool. The inputs could be ionizing radiation, and the outputs could be stopping the penetration of ionizing radiation. Because uh, we found that even though barriers to radiation already exist, they often have a bunch of downsides, such as being costly or highly toxic. So, yes. Uh, yeah. The next step, the next step is to design the systems to figure out how to modify this radioactive fungi, uh, and to be able to uh, incorporate the polymers of bismuth uh, trioxide uh, that are already very good at shielding radiation. So some of the other ideas we thought about were expanding the usual light wavelength for plants and bacteria that can detect specific hormones. And some of the questions we have are if the fungi is compatible with bismuth trioxide to begin with, or if it can become an optional radio proof. And what we like best about this project is just that, you know, it's cool. And it and like it's part of both of our interests. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Very great work. Uh, super cool. I like the, the test to just blast them with radiation. That's nice and easy. Just have a radiation detector below it and throw some above the fungi, see what happens. Uh, yeah, I think especially with uh, how much lead needs to be used currently for blocking radiation, having a, a more biological source that's less harmful, maybe easier or cleaner to produce, that would be a really fantastic technology. Um, yeah. So if you were if you were to make this uh, system with the fungi that sort of can already eat it, um, are there ways that you think you'd want to improve the existing fungi to to sort of make your system work better than what nature um, sort of has as the default? Right. Uh, so we were initially thinking about like since uh, the uh, C. spherosperm already has like a high melanin count uh, and like that, it's using that to kind of shield from the harmful effects of radiation while using like its energy to metabolize it. Uh, we were thinking like making it more compatible with like bismuth trioxide. So like we could create like a non like non toxic, uh, cost efficient and effective uh, radiation shield uh, that could kind of grow and bioremediate by itself. Um, so like it would require less maintenance as well as like uh, what we currently have as like polyethylene and lead uh, and all of that. So yeah, that's kind of where we're heading towards this idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great. That would be a really impactful technology as well. Awesome work. Hello. We are all right, and those are all of our presentations for today. Let's give our teams another huge round of applause. This was such a creative set of projects, and you all have done so much work, uh, really just doing the research and figuring out what these interesting systems are, how we can apply them, and how we can use them to solve big problems. Um, since we have some extra time, does anyone have questions for, for any of the group so far? No worries if not. I know it's a lot of a lot of groups. Um, I can also switch back to uh, Alexandra's presentation. If anyone has questions, since we didn't uh, have a chance to ask uh, Alexander questions when we were presenting earlier. Um, yeah, it would be great to get some feedback. Yeah, so this is a, a really great project. Um, I think being able to grade something like PET is really important. Um, I really liked the uh, choice of looking for organisms that already can do things like this and do it well. Um, I think, yeah, the structure, when you talk about the structure and scale improvements, I think that's definitely a huge aspect, especially for something like bioremediation. Um, do you have a target sort of location or application that you want to use this for? Are you thinking the ocean? Are you thinking in landfills, maybe both? I, I am thinking we address the issue before it actually gets uh, into the environment by creating some sort of um, plastic elimination system where uh, industries or places that usually produce plastic um, or, or use it and have waste plastic can just um, put it in an incubator with the bacteria and have it be digested before it has to go to landfill. Um, That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's sorry. One one sec. It's uh, it's a little difficult to have bacteria be able to grow in harsh harsher environments, um, and the additional requirement of having some sort of kill switch makes it so that it would be great to um, it would be great to centralize this 
uh, this system around like somewhere where you can control the temperature. Yeah, that would be great. And I think doing it sort of locally with places that are producing or need to throw away this PET would be great. And I think you could have maybe each facility that has this have a small like uh, a tank or something like that, that you can you can put all the plastic into and the bacteria will just degrade it maybe at high temperatures or something like that. All right, awesome work. Um, Thank you. And yeah, we have had some really fantastic uh, presentations so far. So yeah, again, a huge thank you to our hardworking creative students. Thank you for spending part of your lunchtime with us here today. I know some of them already had to head out, but thanks again for doing that. And, uh, it was so great to hear more about your work. Um, fantastic job, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, for the students who are left, one of you at this point, and Bettina, I did want to let you know, I um, did leave the, um, I opened Canvas so that okay. it'll stay open now until um, November 1st. So oh, okay. you guys will, you know, we'll post the recording, like all great, of that will be in there. And if <laughs> students want to pull, you know, you guys will still be able to access it at least through November 1st. Okay, great. So, sorry <laughs> about that. that. That's okay. It was just like, poof, gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right. Exactly. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad so many of students were able to get on and actually yeah, join us. Yeah, that was good. Sorry. Yeah. So you guys go get some lunch before it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. Um, I, uh, if you have a minute.